Coming up, the National Indian Health Board has a new advocate, and what do flags mean for Indigenous people? Plus, meet a Bush fellow who advocates for motherhood. I am Aaliyah Chavez. Join us for those interviews, plus headlines from the ICT Newscast. The Walter Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communication at Arizona State University is a proud supporter of Indian Country Today. Students at Cronkite News and Gaylord College at the University of Oklahoma cover indigenous communities together. This important work is distributed by more than 100 news organizations. This collaboration provides a much needed boost to coverage of Native American communities nationwide. Learn more at cronkitenews.azpbs.org. This is the ICT Newscast with Aliyah Chavez. Amarawa Hoopa. Thank you for joining us and happy summer solstice. A group of investors is asking the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission to consider indigenous people when enforcing rules on climate change. ICT's editor-at-large, Mark Trahant, has the story, which is part of his year-long series on indigenous economics. Investors have been demanding that companies and mutual funds have a climate change plan. And now, federal regulators are saying it must back up that plan with action. But is that enough? More than 120 investors say no. A letter to the SEC said the rights of indigenous people must also be considered because they are risks to investors that result in significant losses. The protests over the Dakota Access Pipeline near Standing Rock tripled costs of that project to more than $12 billion. And Energy Transfer Partners ended up with a long-time decline in the company value. Potential risk for investors arises from the failure to identify, assess, and manage indigenous rights risk, notes the letter. But the best way to limit these risks is to align with the UN principle of free, prior, and informed consent. The current SEC proposal does not reference indigenous people. And Kate Finn, Osage, from First Peoples Worldwide, calls that a missed opportunity so that investors can gauge how indigenous people fit into the risk of mining or energy development. The SEC's comment period for climate-related disclosures ended Friday. In Phoenix, Mark Trahant, ICT Newscast. Now to highlight a robotics team from the Cherokee Nation that took its talents all the way to the World Championship. The team from Oklahoma was, was one of several representatives at the VEX Robotics Tournament held last month in Dallas, Texas. To qualify, the 5th, 7th, and 8th graders took part in the state competition, placing second. In May, the young Bright Minds represented their small community on a big stage, with many of their competitors coming from different places around the world. One of their tasks was to score points by programming their robots to complete a series of tasks. The team competed in the middle school division among 78 teams and ranked number 42 at the end of the three-day tournament. Congratulations to the entire team and great job. While well, Nunavik is experiencing some of the most dramatic effects of climate change, the northern Canadian region's main power source includes diesel-powered generators. Now, Inuit are looking to harness untapped solar and wind power. APTN's Emilia Fournier reports. Who better than the Inuit of Nunavik and the Inuit of the world to take on that lead because we have the most to lose and we're losing the most. Nunavik is experiencing the most dramatic effects of climate change, but the region relies on diesel fuel as a power source. Now, Inuit are looking to harness the land's untapped solar and wind power. If we're given the message that global warming is happening like Sheila has been doing, then we have to practice what we're telling the world by going into clean energy. Inuit owned and operated Takuti Energy Corporation will develop renewable energy projects in collaboration with local co-ops and Hydro-Quebec will distribute the power. All of these connections of trying to be creative and innovative is really important. Sheila Watkloutsie is an Inuit ecological activist who is helping Takuti find solutions and communicate with communities. If we can take ownership and feel like, oh, we're in control here and we're doing something not only to protect our land and our waters, but we're also doing something for the entire planet because the Arctic's ice serves as the, as the air conditioner and it's breaking down. 
Tarkuti is a joint venture between Makovic Corporation and Fédération des Coopératives du Nouveau-Québec, two main economic development organizations in Nunavik. Makovic President Pita Atami says the corporation is set up to benefit Inuit. We're not there to try to make money. We just want to have clean energy. And uh, whatever money that we make, we're going to give it right to the community where the energy is being produced. While this renewable energy will flow through Hydro-Québec's grid and the company will collect user fees, Hydro-Québec president and CEO Sophie Brachu says they'll only play a supporting role. We're here to help, not to tell the people what to do. We're going to provide our expertise. At the end of the day, it will be their call. Tarkuti is still measuring wind data and figuring out logistical issues of transporting equipment and storing solar energy. So there is no set date for when Inuit will have access to renewable energy. But Wat Cloutier is optimistic about the effect this will have on generations to come. This is the opening, I think, that's going to lend itself out to uh, different innovative, imaginative, sustainable activities in our region. Emilia Fournier, APTN National News, Montreal. An iconic building connected to the history of Indigenous people in Minneapolis, Minnesota is finally being renovated. The Minneapolis American Indian Center closed this month. It is being prepared for its first major million-dollar renovation in its 47-year history. The massive project has already secured $25 million, and it will need an additional $5 million to complete the renovations. Over the past year, water dripping from the roof has become a steady stream. And while a leaky roof demands quick attention, the call to renovate goes back to 2013. That year, Ojibwe citizen Mary Lagarde pivoted from being the center's grant writer to its interim director, a role she now holds permanently. You know, just looking at the building, um, putting the buckets out, you know, when it rains, um, you know, it definitely, um, I, we knew that for years, um, I, you know, we knew that the Indian Center needed um, some attention um, to it. And so back in, it was in 2013, um, when we really, really started this process. Phase one of the center's renovation is scheduled to be completed by summer of 2025. And those are the headlines for the ICT newscast. Coming up, the Stars and Stripes are on display now ahead of 4th of July and meet an Ojibwe woman who is passionate about the health of mothers and children. But first, health care is a guaranteed right through treaties. What does that mean today? Stay with us. Indian Country Today is now ICT. Aaron Payment has joined the National Indian Health Board as its Director of Government Relations. He's a former chairman of the Sault Ste. Marie Tribe of Chippewa Indians. Hi, Aaron, and congratulations to you. Ani Buju, thank you very much. I'm glad to be here. So at a high level, tell us what you do at the National Indian Health Board. So my title is Director of Government Relations. Um, in the past, it was a position uh, for congressional relations, but we wanted to make sure that it was more reflective of our relationships with tribes as well as um, carrying that message uh, to members of Congress. Um, so the high level is monitoring regulations and um, uh, legislation and supporting legislation uh, that Indian tribes uh, will benefit uh, in, in the terms of health. Our agenda is set by the tribes during our annual conference and resolutions. And so our job is to follow through on the resolutions that are passed by tribes to bring health equity and resources to tribal communities. You're joining at a time when health equity is so important. I mean, we're in the coronavirus pandemic right now, but what are you hearing from tribal nations about what their biggest concerns are? So the, the pandemic was a very big one that laid bare some of the lack of resources that tribal communities have, the broadband issues, connectivity, telehealth, 
Um, we're really grateful that the president reached out to tribal communities and uh, made, made available $1 billion in broadband and then another $2 billion that was made available on the jobs and infrastructure bill. Um, we're hoping not to go backwards. Um, a lot of uh, legislation um, and administration laxed requirements during the pandemic. Uh, we are always in an epidemic. Uh, we have the worst of the worst statistical outcomes. So we don't want to go backwards. We want to maintain a lot of the progress that we made under the pandemic. And basically, it's making sure that tribes have the resources to be able to bring health care to their tribal members. Maybe talk about um, for tribal leaders who are Talking about the health disparity, uh, sorry, the health disparities that already exist before COVID, things like high obesity rates, high rates of uh, diabetes. Um, how are they feeling about those kinds of um, statistics now that you know we're in a COVID world? Yeah, so um, my background is in quantitative statistics. I, whenever I'm asked to give a uh, recitation of that, I appreciate it. So it, it's important because it shows um, data-driven and actual facts. And so our life expectancy is at least five and a half years less than the general population. In some Lakota communities, it can be up to 30 years disparity. Um, our diabetes-related deaths is 3.2 times. Unintentional uh, deaths, uh, injuries and deaths is two and a half times. Homicides, 2.1. It goes on and on. Suicides, maternal death rates. Maternal death rates are 4.5. Um, alcohol. 16% in our community, 8% uh, versus 8%, and alcohol-related deaths is 6.6 .6 times in our community. And so when we know the statistics, we know the data, we know there's a federal responsibility for health care, and we're not doing all that well. We're improving, but we have a lot more work to do in making sure that the federal government knows the scorecard and that we advocate for our tr respective tribal nations. You've mentioned several times wanting to work with the Biden administration with members of Congress. When you're speaking to these elected officials, uh, what is their response in terms of how much they're willing to help Indian country? So what we find is that there's a real lack of understanding um, in Congress. And it's unfortunate because we, we've we been here for a while and the trust responsibility has been here forever. There's a treaty and trust obligation to fulfill and healthcare is part of that for as long as the grass grows, the winds blow and the rivers flow. Um, and, but sometimes the, the barrier we come up against is the OMB um, has these spending authorities that Congress puts in place and they lump us in with discretionary funding. When we prepaid for every every penny that we get with over uh, 500 million acres of land. And so we should be exempted from that um, when there's impacts of sequestration or government shutdowns. And the Biden administration is on board um, pushing for mandatory funding and advanced appropriations. Um, he proposed, President Biden and Vice President Harris proposed that in the last budget cycle. But in the continuing resolution, we got kind of cut off and cut short. But um, he's pushing for it again, and we're reviving that effort. And so the National Indian Health Board is working with the National Congress of American Indians. Uh, people can go to our website, nihb.org, to see uh, letters, how you can contact your members of Congress, and urge them to understand it and to honor the treaty and trust obligation. We only have about 30 seconds left, but of course, NIHB is celebrating a huge milestone this year. Tell us about what you're doing to celebrate that. Yes, it's our 50th anniversary, and we encourage people to join us. It's going to be in Washington, D.C., September 26th through the 28th. We're going to have special sessions for tribal leaders to highlight the needs in their community, to brag about the good things that are happening in our community. And if you would like to join us, please go to our website at nihb.org and register to join us. We'd love to see you in person. Well, hopefully we can see each other in person as well. Aaron, thank you so much for being here. Thank you very much. Chimi Grinch.
June 14th is Flag Day. It commemorates the day in 1777 when the United States approved the design for its first national flag. On the upcoming holiday of July 4th, we're sure to see imagery of flags and fireworks. But what do the stars and stripes mean to Indigenous people? Cheryl Crazy Bull has been thinking about this. She's the president and CEO of the American Indian College Fund. Welcome, Cheryl. Thank you. I'm happy to be here with you. So let's talk about your own tribal flag. You're a citizen of the Rosebud Sioux tribe. Tell us what it means to you. Yeah, so our tribal flag uh, is symbolic of our uh, Teoshbais and our Tewahes, which is the way we describe our extended families. And uh, they uh, settled in communities when the reservation was established. And uh, those 21 original communities are represented in a camp circle on our flag. Uh, and so I think of them as uh, symbolic, both of our traditional knowledge about ourselves as families and communities, but also of our representative government. Yeah, we see that so often. I mean, at powwows or at really an, any major native conference, we see the posting of the colors. What do you think that that represents for native people? Yeah, I think it's a real, um, challenging representation for Native people because I think we both understand the sovereignty of our tribal nations and that flags can be symbolic of that sovereignty, that they can uh, reflect some teachings or some understandings of who you are as people. And then also the great challenges that are associated with, um, you know, the, the wars and battles, things like that, that uh, the posting of the colors also represents. You know, so often it's graduation season now. We see graduates when they uh, walk across the aisle, they'll bring their tribal flag and they'll wear it on their back. Um, you know, with your work at uh, the American Indian College Fund, maybe talk about that with students, uh, you know, using their flags as a way to symbolize who they are and where they come from. Yeah, I think the, the College Fund, uh, one of the ways that we contribute is uh, through public education. And we really recognize that uh, symbolism is very important. And many times our students, especially students who don't attend tribal colleges and universities, they might be fairly alone in their uh, educational journey. And so the use of a flag uh, often really connects them to their own people. We also know from all of our students, students at tribal colleges and universities and mainstream institutions that the main reason that they go to college is because they wanna make a difference for their family and their community. So they wanna give back. And I think that connecting to uh, the flag as a symbol is kind of a public showing that they intend to give back, that they're both proud of what they did and then they look forward to their future. We so often see a lot of Native students do this at uh, uh, graduations for tribal colleges and universities, which are just exceptional institutions for Native students. Maybe talk about TCUs and what, where you see them fitting in right now. Yeah, so t tribal colleges and universities that are tribally chartered are actually a symbol of the sovereignty of tribes. Uh, tribes uh, establish those institutions because of their sovereign right to provide education to their community. Uh, so I think of those as both um, you know, an act of sovereignty, but also tribal colleges and universities are really centers of hope and opportunity in communities. They're very much uh, representative of the traditions and the possibilities that exist in our communities. So they're really great place-based institutions that really, um, I had a friend that used to say, you know, it's Indians going to school with Indians. And uh, that's just really a great thing to have happen. My goodness. I mean, just off the top of my head, I think of TCUs and I see so many smiling faces and just distinguished faculty. What are some of the main TCUs that you want to highlight or that you frequently talk about to folks? Oh, you know, I'm in love with all of the TCUs. There are 35 of them that are accredited and members of the American Indian Higher Education Consortium. And there are developing institutions uh, like California Tribal College or, you know, uh, Pawnee Nation College that are, you know, both members of AHEC, but also um, just on their own kind of moving forward. So I like to think of each of them as unique and each of them as providing students with a place where their identity uh, is honored. And uh, so I don't like to really single anyone out because I think they're all, you know, special institutions in their own way. 
You know, now that we're coming out of the pandemic, we saw so many TCUs who were able to offer even more resources to Native students. Do you think that that's something that we'll continue to see in the future? I think it it will continue. Uh, you know, a lot of support comes to organizations like the American Indian College Fund to provide students with scholarships and other support services. We're removing one of the number one barriers to student education, which is their financial well being. And if we can give students that kind of continued support, I think we'll continue to see the success that uh, we've been building on actually for more than 50 years. Well, Cheryl Crazy Bull, thank you so much. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Indian Country Today is now ICT. We are honored to bring you another interview from this year's class of Bush Fellows. Open to residents of the Dakotas and Minnesota, these project-based grants can be up to two years and $100,000. Rebecca Dunlap is a certified nurse midwife from the Fond du Lac Band of Lake Superior. She is determined to revitalize Ojibwe practices around childbirth. Welcome, Rebecca, and congratulations to you. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> so tell us about your project. Yeah, so I'm, I'm just, uh, thank you so much for having me and I'm really honored to be here and to be uh, a Bush Fellowship Fellow for the 2022 year. Um, I decided to apply um, so it would align when I graduated with my um, doctorate in nursing and um, midwifery um, because my hope was that then I could finish the, um, the degree and work on my dreams of pursuing a birth center for the Fond du Lac Reservation. Um, and so that's really my goal. I'm hoping to uh, use the next two years to really work on learning more about how I can do that and then finishing the two years with um, hopefully opening up something for the reservation. Maybe talk about what the major differences are between a birth center and giving birth at a hospital. Yeah, so I've been a doula since the early 2000s for my tribe at Fond du Lac. And one thing that I kept hearing from tribal members is that they were interested in having something different and pursuing something outside of the hospital setting, whether that be at home or in a birth center. Um, and we did have a birth center in our area for a while. And I did see tribal members that were taking the opportunity to utilize that space. Um, and that's really nice because with a birth center, um, oftentimes they'll take insurance. And so it makes it a little bit more cost efficient for people. Um, and so just, you know, in rural areas, it's really hard to access care too. And so having something on the reservation would just be so much more beneficial for people. Maybe talk about your work in terms of trying to integrate Ojibwe cultures and values into something so sacred as giving birth to a child. Yeah, that's one teaching I received throughout the years too, working um, for my tribe is that pregnancy and birth are really a sacred ceremonial time. And I learned that that's a time when everybody should really be walking in ceremony with that person. So whether that means, you know, that person is um, eating and, and drinking fluids and staying hydrated and being healthy, um, having other people that are also doing the same thing with you. And also some things that I've learned along the way are how important our traditional values and our language are in bringing new life into the world. Um, and, you know, treating that person that's carrying that life in a sacred way and also bringing um, the child in in a good way. Um, and with a home birth or a birth center, it, you get a little bit more freedom to utilize your um, cultural practices than you may in um, a hospital setting, so. 
as uh, people give birth and, um, you know, are starting to raise a child, maybe talk about some of the challenges that young mothers or young parents face. Another big reason why I went into midwifery and why I'm wanting to pursue what I am is because American Indian people and Alaska Native people have really high rates of um, infant and maternal mortality. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of other uh, comorbidities that, that can often be seen in Alaska Native, Native people. Um, so when they're pregnant, you might often see high blood pressure or hemorrhaging, um, things like that. And so it's a really important time to really take care of your health. Um, so I think, you know, health-wise, there's a lot of challenges. Um, and, and also, like I was saying, in rural health care, um, uh, I think there's a big challenge is transportation and receiving the care that you need. Also, being able to meet the, the unique challenges that we have as Alaska Native and um, Native American people. And... You know, I think it's really valuable, really important that they can see providers that are from their community and that really understand the unique needs that we have in our communities, because we do really have unique challenges and we need people that can can understand that and can be um, and then it could just be cognizant of of the care that is needed within um our communities and every community is really different. And so having individuals from your community that can understand and can help support you is really, really valuable. Well, Rebecca, thank you so much. And please visit us again. Thank you so much for having me. And that's a slice of our Indigenous world. For more news, visit IndianCountryToday.com. From all of us in the newsroom, stay safe, my relatives. I am Aaliyah Chavez. Sometimes you got to take a stand just because you know you can. Oh, you got to run, you got to run. Got to run.